Good to go. All right. Good evening and welcome to tonight's study session, or actually it's a special session because we have two items on the agenda. The first is a presentation regarding the FYE 2022 City of Norman Capital Budget and the Capital Improvements Financial Plan for FYE 2023 through 2026. We also have an executive session following, but for now I will turn it over to, uh, I don't know who's doing the presentation, so our Department of Finance. I don't know you, but I'm pretty sure you're not Anthony Francisco. Right. I'm going to take over the first part of this form. So see if we can get this going. Jacob, go ahead and introduce yourself. Some, some uh, members of council may not have met you yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jacob Huckabee. I am a budget technician here in the finance department. And um, I kind of work on the capital uh, budget side. So. Anything dealing with that, you're more than welcome to come to me for those things. Okay, can everybody see the presentation okay? Yes. Okay. All right, so um, like I said, my name is Jacob Huckabee. I'm the budget technician here for the city. And we're gonna go over today, um, the first part of this, it's basically just going to be an overview for um, some familiar faces and some new faces to get a better idea of um, what is going to be included in this capital improvement plan and in the documents that have been provided for the preliminary budgets. Um, before we get started, just want to go over a kind of brief review of the calendar. Um, on the November 17th, we went over uh, some statuses on some currently funded projects. And then... Um, we got some input from council on what their priorities are going to be for this upcoming fiscal year. On February 16th, we discussed some proposed new projects for this upcoming fiscal year in 2022. And then today we're reviewing the final proposed, proposed plan for the fiscal year ending in 2022. And so in this CIP budget, um, there's various funds that are gonna be included in it. I'll go ahead and point out um, the two biggest pieces are going to be the bullet points with capital fund on there. Uh, the first portion being the PAYGO portion, which is funded through the capital sales tax. And the next portion is going to be the general obligation bond portion of the capital fund. You'll also see the enterprise funds are included in this budget document, but today we will not be discussing those in too much detail. I think we're going over that on uh, May 18th in on its own session, but they will be discussed a little bit. So now you should see um, a pie chart that lists all of the revenues for the CIP budget. The biggest portion is going to be the bonds. That is not always the case, but for this fiscal year, it's going to be the case. Um, next, down in that bottom right-hand side, you're going to see the capital sales tax portion, which is going to be that seven-tenths of one percent sales tax. Um, and then in the top right, another big portion is going to be the user fees, which is going to fund all of the enterprise funds. Uh, next, we have the expense side of the equation. On the bottom side, uh, you're going to see a large chunk of that's going to be building ground. That's going to be due to the, the large Norman Forward projects that are currently happening. Um, Parks and Rec is also going to be a pretty big portion. On that right side, the transportation side, that's going to be all of our traffic calming, street striping, all those street projects that you're going to see in the book. So as to what is the Capital Improvements Fund, um, it was established in 1976 by a voter referendum, and it set up a fund that's going to have multiple sources of revenue coming in. One of those is going to be the seven-tenths of one percent sales tax. Um, that's going to fund all the PAYGO projects. And then we also have the general obligation bonds that are going to help um, fund a lot of those projects. And occasionally we have private um, reimbursements on those. And then um, just want to point out again that the enterprise funds are going to be funded by the fees on the services that those provide. So that's where the user fees are going to be listed. And what we have here is going to be a, um, 
diagram showing the guidelines that were set up on how to spend this capital money coming in. These are only guidelines, but you'll see that 25% is gonna be allocated to street maintenance, 27% to capital outlay. And then the largest chunk of that is gonna to be to debt services and other projects. And that's debt services on our general obligation bonds and a few of the other facilities. Um, so now we're gonna move on to the status of the capital fund. What you'll see here is gonna be uh, for fiscal year ending 21, 22 and 23, we'll all have a negative amount, which means that if um, council would like to fund any new projects going forward, it'll mean sacrificing money in any of the current projects that are already there. So um, going forward, that's gonna be something to keep in mind. And then at the bottom, you'll notice that we should be expecting some new bond revenue for the 2019 uh, general obligation bond that was passed. That should be the second tranche of money coming in. So now we're gonna move on to the capital outlay section. And before I get into this, I'll just reiterate the difference in capital outlay and capital projects. Capital projects are typically um, a lifespan of over five years, totaling more than $100,000 and the capital outlay is gonna be a more tangible asset with a lifespan of anywhere from one to five years. So it's gonna be our furniture, our computer equipment, things like that. And so if you look through this list, we have our general fund, which has some computer replacements, um, a pretty good amount of fleet replacements. And then in our department re requests, we have things like police and fire equipment, and then uh, the nice new speaker equipment for the Blake Baldwin skate park. And then we have the public safety sales tax fund, which also has fleet replacements, and then about 113,000 in um, requests for police and fire equipment. And then um, onto the Westwood fund, we have 131,000 in department requests. Uh, those include a mower, some golf cart, golf cart replacements, and then also a new beverage cart with a nice new display. So that'll be really nice for all the golfers out at Westwood. And then we have the public transportation fund, which has fleet replacements of 692,000. And I believe that should cover um, two of the two uh, larger public transportation vehicles. And then a third one is also in there, but that should be funded with grant money. So that will not be included in that amount. And they also have some department requests needing a forklift and some computers. And then um, lastly, in the enterprise funds, they have computer replacements, fleet replacements, which is a pretty good amount. And then um, the department requests, including software, computer hardware, dumpsters, poly carts, things of that nature. And that will conclude my part of this presentation. So I will pass this computer on to our director of finance, Anthony Francisco. Thank you, Jacob. Um, a couple of things that Jacob mentioned that I want to emphasize. Um, the first was he, he talked about the book and understand that there's actually two books, two budget documents, one that which is the, um, primarily the operational and summarized budget document, the big book, that's about 600 pages, uh, which includes a summary of all of the capital program projects that were talked about here. But then there's a second book with, with, that is the Capital Improvement Project book that shows detail for all of these individual projects that we're talking about here and all of the projects that are planned over the next five years are discussed in detail in that capital book. So if you have an interest in any individual capital project, you can find information about that individual project in the CIP budget document. So, so just understand the book that he's talking about, the book that he works on the most is that CIP budget document. And the second thing I wanted to emphasize was about that uh, $52 million general obligation bond sale that we have budgeted to be done during the course of this coming fiscal year. Um, that may or may not be timed uh, to have a closing before the end of June 30th of 22. It may be some or all of the 52 million that remains in authorization from the 2019 GO bond vote, but just know that the budget for this year does reflect that entire $52 million of remaining authorization 
to come in in this fiscal year. What actually happens will be totally de dependent on uh, the timing of the projects that are, that are going forward and how fast we're moving with those projects. So here's some projects that are underway right now. Um, anyone who drives on Flood Avenue or in the vicinity of, of North Base has seen the transit and park maintenance facility buildings going up. It's quite an impressive site. Uh, and we're looking forward to the completion of those projects. It's about an eight and a half million dollar total project. Uh, and we hope to add a vehicle wash facility um, if we can find money within that budget um, to complete what we plan to do uh, to, to maintain all of those vehicles at North Base. The TMDL study uh, is ongoing. I think council talked about that in your last meeting. It'll be continued in, the, in this fiscal year and into next fiscal year. Uh, fire Station 9 is just about done. Uh, all of the renovations have been completed, fire admin building, um, just some, some punch list items yet to be done. Um, Interstate Drive, the Mal Cars resurfacing project is nearing completion. I think everybody's seen that. That's about a million dollar project, um, but it's a, a great improvement for folks that are traveling in that area. Um, we've talked a lot about the 24th Avenue East project. That's a $15 million project that is nearing completion. Uh, Porter Avenue and Acre Street, we'll talk about these projects that are bond funded in more detail. That's about a $3.5 million project. Um, the land use plan update uh, is still needing to be completed. It's in, the, it's in this year's budget. Um, and, and the transportation plan update is also including in this year's budget, although that's about complete. Here's some pictures of the ongoing renovation of the municipal complex, a project near and dear to, to many of our hearts. Um, and um, Brenda has done a great job of managing this project. But right now, the building is gutted. And, and, and what you see down there at the lower right is, is just some decorative like little furniture that we put in there to show you what it's gonna look like when it's finished out. But right now it's just blank walls. Um, and I know that council was really looking forward to doing the wall breaking instead of a ground breaking and that didn't get done, but the project is underway um, and, and well under construction. A legacy trail is being extended between 24th and 36th Avenue. Um, there is a utility relocation project that is in anticipation of that 36th Avenue widening project and the utility relocation is ongoing. We'll talk about the I-35 and Robinson project um, that is ongoing. There is a flood avenue from Gray Street to Acres project uh, that's under design and we hope will get underway uh, later this calendar year. Um, and then there's been a lot of discussion about the, uh, what we're calling the Mattoon property on Alameda at Finley. Uh, that is an ongoing project right now. Uh, there's a, a big cleanup operation going on right now. And I know the council has had a lot of input and discussion about that, but just know that that is being funded out of the capital fund and out of the CDBG fund and it is underway. Here's some pictures of some of those projects that are underway, uh, just as an example of one of the urban reconstruction projects, one of the rural road projects, and one of the urban asphalt projects. And again, um, the 2016 five-year program is just about complete, and our voters on April the 6th reapproved that program. So you'll see a lot more of these projects, very similar to these, um, underway over the next five years. And that's what you see pictured down there at the lower right. It's been a very successful program and a program that our voters have approved with a two thirds plurality um, most recently. Here's a look at that 36th Avenue project that has been underway since uh, the voters approved general obligation bonds for this project in 2012. Uh, as we discussed, the utility relocation is underway and we have uh, just a few properties um, right of way to be acquired. Uh, and then the project will be teed up and ready to go. 
The problem is up here um, with federal funds yet to be acquired. And um, the federal funds for that project under the FHWA project that we usually have um, qualified for federal funding is not looking very good for getting those, those federal funds anytime soon. So we hope to be able to find some other sources of, of federal matching funds for that project. We have about a $11 million gap in what we need to do to complete that project. And we have expected federal funds for that. And we hope that that'll be forthcoming. As I'm going along here, if you have any questions for myself or a lot of the project managers are also available on this um, Zoom meeting. So feel, feel free to, to pose your questions as we're going along. This I-35 in Robinson Crossroads project has been anticipated for many years. Um, and what it will do is basically help to solve the congestion problems where basically the intersections are too close together. Um, so the intersection of Crossroads and the intersection of I-35 Frontage Road is gonna be moved about 300 yards further apart, which will help with the uh, traffic stacking when you're waiting for those traffic signals. Um, you will no longer be able to access uh, Robinson from over here. This will be cul-de-sac out. Um, there'll be encouragement of uh, the protected right turn for eastbound traffic um, going on to Robinson. And, and again, we've been talking about this project for a long time, but the beauty of it uh, for folks like Sean O'Leary and, uh, and old street guys like me is, is dirt is flying and the project is underway. Um, you see here the uh, stormwater drainage box that's being built. Um, dirt work is being built to actually lay, to, to lay the roadbed for uh, what will be that improved um, off-ramp from I-35 southbound to go eastbound on Robinson. And this is the actual frontage road that's being relayed uh, on the east side or rather the west side of I-35. So again, um, from a bird's eye view, you can see that the project is well underway. It has been a project that thousands of our motorists and residents have been anticipating for a long time. Um, so with the combination of University of North Park TIF money and federal matching money, we're finally there from the standpoint of at least, you can see the, the, the construction being done and, and the project be complete late this year. We have ongoing programs to improve State Highway 9 and widen it all the way from one city limit to the other from east to west. Um, uh, and, and again, this is a big project that's under construction now, the part that is um, on about 72nd Avenue is the next piece that's under construction. Again, it will be, um, what, five years or so, Sean, before it's actually finally complete. But as each section is completed, there's major improvements that will be enjoyed by motorists, not just from Norman, but from all over the, the, the region. Porter Avenue and Acres is one of our 2019 general obligation bond projects. Uh, the intersection improvements are underway. That, that weird catacorner corner, corner um, is going to be greatly improved where um, you will no longer be able to access from Daw Street, that'll be cul-de-sac out. And the weird cattle corner intersection of Acres and Porter will be widened and improved greatly. And again, the beauty of that is that dirt is fine. It is under construction. Our voters that have approved these general obligation bond projects or that UMP TIF money um, are seeing the fruits of their votes and their interest uh, for many years moving forward now. So, um, I know it can be a hassle to see, um, you know, lane closures and traffic backups, but what I see here is, is a great progress being made on a project that has been envisioned and anticipated for a very long time. The next piece of that project is the Porter Avenue streetscape down to the south of Acre Street and to the north of Acre Street up to Robinson, there'll be decorative lighting, there'll be new bus stops and sidewalks. Um, 
The construction on that will start late this year. It'll take about six months, I believe, about a year to complete once it has been started. James Garner Avenue, whether you call it James Garner or you call it Front Street, this has been a project that has been anticipated for a long time. And with Norman Forward funding and federal matching funds, we're finally getting to the place um, that this project is about to get started uh, from the intersection where it will tie into Flood Avenue to where it will tie in at Acre Street and in the 2019 bond project will be extended south of Acre Street uh, down to Duffy. It will include decorative lighting. It'll include that bridge over Robinson Street um, and it will tie in with a modern roundabout at Flood Avenue. So this will be a major new entryway into downtown Norman, uh, right along the railroad tracks. But one of the things that I like to, to envision and point out is that it will be a new front door into our municipal complex. Uh, so here's the library. Municipal complex is about right there. Um, and, and if that is your destination from all points north, um, you have a new way to get there and it will relieve traffic on Flood Avenue greatly. Um, so we're really looking forward to that construction getting underway. The Jenkins project um, comes from her Holman's baby. Um, again, funded with the 2019 General Obligation Bond Program. We're expecting bids to be open next year for the federal matching project. Uh, but one of the nice things about this project is how it will tie in Imhoff Road with Constitution with the new alignment that'll actually open up a little more land in Rees Park. The OU softball complex will move from here to somewhere in this vicinity. Um, and again, great new access for that facility. Um, and we're really looking forward to all of those things to tie in with the improvements that the city is making with the Norman Forward Program at Reeves Park. So again, the traffic access to all of those great facilities is gonna be greatly improved by this project over the next year or two. We had some questions at the public hearing um, about the potential of undergrounding the utilities related to this project. And so the Public Works Department has done some preliminary looking at the, um, at the power lines and, and the overhead lines that are there now, what would need to be relocated and undergrounded and what it would entail to do that. Uh, the major lines are going along Jenkins, 2,100 feet of, of um, power lines and cable lines and Wi-Fi. Uh, fiber uh, that would have to be relocated and buried. Um, and, and make no mistake, this would be a major expense that has not been anticipated in that general obligation bond program. You'll recall that when um, we, we did underground utilities along Lindsay Street uh, from 24th Avenue to Berry Road, uh, that was about a $2 million undertaking. And this is about the same length of street, the same sort of utilities that would have to be undergrounded. So you have to assume that this is going to be in the seven figures to do that. And there's no source of funding to do that. Nice if you can afford it, but, but I'm not so sure that certainly within the budget that we have now that we can afford it. Any questions about that? I'm sure that uh, Sean can give you more information than I can about the details of, of what would need to be done. Yes, sir. Anthony, I think Councilmember Holman has a question. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't recall the power lines or the utility lines, I should say, on this stretch. Um, interfering with the trees that are there. Um, if that's the case, then I don't know that it's a big 
deal to bury the power lines on this stretch. Uh, but, you know, I would say the concern a lot of us have in the community and that we've heard is, is that especially lately, utility companies have been slicing the trees in half, uh, more than in half in some cases. It's like 75%. Uh, and so now there's just a few branches leaning over the street and nothing over the sidewalk. And it looks really strange on Chautauqua, south of Lindsay and on Barry north, uh, well, just all along Barry now, but, um, and that's what I would hope to avoid here. Um, I haven't seen any instances that I can recall though of the utility companies messing with the trees over here because of the utility lines that they might be far enough apart. Um, and just to clarify too, the utility lines are already buried or just don't exist north of Timberdale, is that correct? I think that is a good point. Again, the, the, uh, the focus of our preliminary work here is south of Timberdale because everything north of there is already underground or at least the power and uh, the typical overhead utilities are already underground. So you're dealing with this south portion of the project. I think our point of our note here, uh, and I've got Scott Sturts online with this too, if, if he needs to step in, uh, the point here is that we have very limited right of way. We're trying to take as little as, as we need from uh, additional space from the university to build the project. And we are quickly running out of room for additional improvements. And if we were to go underground with these four additional utility systems, that would take additional right of way in order to not impact the existing trees that are there. Uh, not unheard of, certainly that would just require us to either acquire more space uh, on the city side, Reeves Park, or more space on the university's side to get out of the way of the existing trees uh, before we did damage to them during the undergrounding process. Right. Um, but again, we're, we're very preliminary here. Uh, we certainly don't have any numbers to offer you today. Anthony did a great job of describing what we do know uh, and we will, at, at your direction, we're going to continue to explore the actual cost in, in real dollars and real land and all of that as we continue to develop the design for the project. And we'll, we'll have that for you here in, in a few months uh, for your final decision. But he's also correct that the, the scope of this project did not include any cost for underground utilities. So um, it's likely that if that were the direction of council, you're going to need to find another million plus in order to add that to the project uh, before it would go to construction. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Sean. I appreciate that. Um, just looking at Google Street View, just to refresh my mind on it, um, to, it, what it shows is that the trees along this part of Jenkins are on the east side of the sidewalk and the power utility lines are on the west side of the sidewalk and it looks to me that they are far enough apart and it looks to me that the power lines or the utility lines and poles themselves um, appear to be actually higher than the trees um, and those trees are old and have been there a long time so I don't know that they're going to get bigger than they are now mm -hmm. um, so I don't uh, my only I guess question would be in the widening project, are we going to be moving the power? Are they going to is are they going to be moving the utility line power poles that are currently there? Um, is that a thing that's going to happen? I'm not sure we know that yet. Scott may have to step in here with us and, and elaborate on that. At this time, we're looking into that more closely, but we do not anticipate moving those electric overhead lines to this area. Uh, you know, part of our concern was if we were to go underground, we'd have to be so far out that we could be getting into the root system of those trees. Yeah. But at this time, we're not anticipating moving those power poles. Okay. Well, that that kind of uh, could be a determining factor to a certain extent, in my opinion, because um, if we don't have to move them from where they're currently at, I don't see them being a problem for the trees that are there and haven't been that I know of. Um, if we were, if we are going to have to move them and they're going to, and they're going to have to rip all of them out and put new ones in and, and possibly interfere with the trees and stuff, then I might want to think about, uh, you know, the options for burying them at that time, if it's going to be a completely redo anyway. 
Um, if we're face, if we're looking at having all brand new poles put in or bearing it underground, I think we might want to talk about a decision at that time, perhaps. But as I see it right now, in my opinion, if we're not moving the poles, um, you know, I might not opt to bury the utility lines along this particular stretch based on the existing uh, circumstances. So I guess I'll stay tuned and hear back from you get from staff whenever we might know about those power poles. Yeah. Appreciate that, Council Rick. I'll just mention too, just for the sake of uh, other council members, one of the things that we get into when we talk about underground utilities, not only is it always very expensive, but I, I, th I think we tend to think about power lines, uh, most of us do, but in reality, and, and it is the case here, we're also dealing with uh, telephone communication or telecommunication in general, Wi-Fi, and of course, top. So the same occurred on, on Lindsay Street. We had, I think, five or six different utilities to bury. It's never just one. And that's why the cost gets so high. That's why the space is so challenging because we're literally trying to create a common utility transfer. They can all place their underground systems in one you know, clean space, but have the appropriate separation that they need. Anyway, just wanted to mention that, that for future reference, that's where the challenges come in when we talk about burying utilities. Thank you, uh, Scott and Sean, for your detailed uh, responses about that. I look forward to discussing it further and would probably, uh, you know, encourage the city going forward. Uh, you know, it'll be a while, I think, before we have another transportation bond, but uh, that we, you know, that the city councils in the future and the city staff in the future think about including, including that in especially any kind of urban area, core area projects um, in the future in those bond uh, uh, totals. So thank you. Thank you all. I think I see Councilmember Hall before we move on. Yeah, I just wanted to um, echo some of those comments. This is something that I receive pretty regular feedback on. Um, and I understand the physical challenges, the economic challenges, but after we've experienced four extreme weather events in one year, that has had a significant impact on people with every one of these um, utility lines. I'm looking at the list of OG&E, cable, AT&T, Wi-Fi. Um, I do think it's the, the time has come to absolutely consider it and part of the discussion as we move forward on other projects. Any other questions or comments? I do not see any. This is just a summation of all of the 2012 um, transportation bond program projects. Um, and as you see here, we're almost done with them except for the half mile of uh, Alameda Street um, and, and the 36th Avenue project, which is the big unknown and the big unfunded project yet to be done. We have available bond funds to do the Alameda project, but not the 36th Avenue project. Here is the same sort of summation list of the 2019 transportation bond projects. We're obviously not as far along with those projects, but again, the next frontier is that Jenkins Avenue project that we have just talked about. It's uh, about nine and a half million dollars of bond money um, that we have available for that project. Um, and we're hoping to look, move forward with that over the next few years. Here's a look at um, our success in garnering federal transportation matching funds over the years, um, over the last 12 or 15 years, and where we think we will be going forward. Um, what you see there in red for fiscal year 21 of about $5 million of federal matching money is locked in. And I think the 22 money is also locked in. Uh, and, and again, our public work staff has done a great job over the years of, of figuring our projects such that we can succeed in getting those federal matching funds, but the rules have changed 
um, such that we have we are not as successful with our um, past planning processes of getting those matching funds. So, so we're going to have to change the way that we do things a bit so that we can continue to get some sort of a similar ratio of federal funds to our local funds moving forward. Here's a look at the vehicle replacement program that Jacob touched on briefly. We have about $2.2 million of um, vehicle replacement money in the capital fund uh, for this coming fiscal year. That's replacing 33 units. And by units, that can be anything from as small, it could be a generator. A lot of them are police cars. Um, it could be as big as a tandem dump truck or, or a backhoe or a front end loader in the public works or street uh, park maintenance department, that sort of thing. So a unit can be you know, anywhere from $5,000 to $500,000 for one unit. We have a, a large allocation for various sidewalk programs um, proposed in the fiscal year 22 budget. And we talked about this in our last um, capital session. So I won't go into a lot of detail here, uh, but, but uh, one thing that I would point out is, is this um, trail project on Hal Muldrow um, that is moving forward. And, and that again has been anticipated for a very long time. Here's a list of some other recurring projects that are included in the fiscal year 22 proposed budget. Uh, the capital outlay money that we have emphasized is the largest. And again, this follows those guidelines that Jacob talked about. Um, the second area, largest area is for street maintenance projects. One thing I would draw your attention to is this recurring $100,000 for community and neighborhood improvements. And that is a recurring uh, program that we have built up some funds We've had some discussion about doing a project to repair some sidewalks and um, um, street lights and that sort of thing on campus corner with some of that money that has been there in this current fiscal year. Uh, and again, projects are to be identified uh, within that $100,000 for the coming year. Moving on then to the public safety sales tax fund. The public safety sales tax fund does include a capital component because you may recall that when the uh, public safety sales tax two ordinance was passed, it included funding for critical capital needs as they were called. Uh, the major ones of which uh, were the emergency radio system. Uh, and it's about done now. Final cost estimate is about 12 million of a $13 million allocation. Um, if there is in fact a million dollars left over from the radio communications project, we would, we would recommend to council that that million dollars be moved toward um, the shortfall that we have for the emergency communications and emergency operations center. So as you see there, we project right now that there's about a $9 million shortfall in that budget. A uh, million dollars would certainly help with that, but it would leave us with about eight and a half million dollars still to find in order to build that project at the level and the scope that we know that we need to do it. And again, the Public Safety Sales Tax Oversight Committee has recommended that we wait until we have adequate funding to do it right before we move forward. Um, we hope that, um, we talked about in our last meeting, we hope that um, the American Rescue Plan funding guidelines will allow for some of those funds, if we receive them, to be used for that project. And again, that has been a long time, high priority, approved by the voters, but we're waiting to try to do it right. And that has been uh, council's direction. That has been the oversight committee's direction. Uh, we tried to get general obligation bonds to do it right uh, in August. But as it stands right now, we're still waiting for funds to be identified uh, to build it at the scope that we want to do it. The 
The public safety sales tax fund also includes an ongoing fire apparatus replacement program. You see that in this fiscal year, uh, we did an air and light unit and a public education trailer. Uh, council approved those projects or, or those purchases uh, earlier in this fiscal year. In the coming fiscal year, we're budgeting for about a three quarters of a million dollar fire engine. Same thing next um, proposed year. And then in fiscal year 24 is a $1.8 million ladder truck. You'll recall that one of the critical capital needs that we actually um, included in the bond program that we did out of the public safety sales tax a few years ago uh, was for what I then called the million dollar fire truck. And now it's a million eight dollar fire truck. Um, so again, the public safety sales tax critical capital needs program for fire apparatus replacement, we always plan on these things to be purchased, but they're costing a lot more than what we thought they were going to cost or certainly more what we planned for them to cost uh, back when the public safety sales tax was approved. So again, we still intend to do everything that was promised. It's just that the funds to do them are, are not matching up with the cost inflation. So, so that's an ongoing problem that we have with the public safety sales tax. Norman Forward projects, again, are part of our capital program. Um, we have a lot of Norman Forward projects that are ongoing or that are nearing completion. We celebrated those at our last meeting. Uh, here's a few projects that are going to be coming up in the future years. We're continuing with the new neighborhood parks. Um, we will continue with repairing and replacing playground equipment at every park in town. Um, we have uh, uh, allocation within Norman Ford for new trails throughout the city uh, for the development of Saxon Park. I think that's going to start in the next year at least on a um, master plan design uh, basis. Uh, Griffin Park, the lease for that land from the Oakland Department of Mental Health is ongoing. And the Canadian River Park has been allocated funds within Norman Forward uh, that will move forward in future years. But here are some Norman Forward projects that are nearing the starting line of dirt flying and construction starting and uh, we're having ongoing meetings with uh, the various ad hoc groups and project teams for all of these projects. But look at where we're going, folks. I mean, this is this is pretty exciting stuff, if you think about it. We've been talking about these things for a lot of years, a lot of years. But that senior wellness center, at the full scope that our um, various interest groups have wanted it to be, not in a phased basis, but built all at one time, is about to start. We're in the final design phases. We're about to um, have the contractor um, and the operator chosen and on board. And, and we're about to start construction on that this calendar year. And here's a little mock-up of what it's gonna look like. And it's, you know, it's gonna be the, the highlight of the Porter Wellness Center campus. Uh, our senior wellness center um, there right off Porter. And then the Young Family Athletic Center in University North Park, um, as Judd Foster likes to say, will be the crown jewel of the Norman Park system. Um, and, and we're very close. We're having meetings on a, on a weekly basis with, with the design team and the engineers and representatives of the Young Family was contributing greatly to this project, both from a financial standpoint and from design standpoint. Um, and, and here's a look at what it is going to look like. Um, those, those swimming pool and indoor swimming facilities that we have been talking about for years and years and years, is about to you know, be a, a hole being dug in the ground. Um, all of those things we've been talking about is about to come to fruition and again, um, for those of us that have been, been baptized by fire with the discussions and public meetings and public debates about these projects for a lot of years to see the point that we're at now is really exciting. 
So that will close our part of the discussion. We will open it up now for council's direction and questions and comments as we move forward in the capital budgeting process. Um, anything that you would like to add, I would again caution you about what Jacob talked about as it relates to the uh, capital sales tax. We are in a negative position. So anything that you would like to add would have to come at the expense of some project that is included uh, right now. We have had um, at the public hearing so far, not just that um, undergrounding discussion about the um, Jenkins Avenue project, but we've also had some discussion about some smaller projects for um, um, some pollinator uh, projects and some historic signs. Uh, we've had some discussion about the bus terminal project that is um, still in negotiation phases to purchase that facility on Porter Avenue. So again, those things are in the works the, where we have had uh, input from the public or from council so far, all of those things are being um, uh, analyzed and, and brought forward to council in the future, but they, they're certainly not falling on deaf ears. Uh, I believe Council Member Behrman has a comment or question. I do, a couple questions. Um, I seem to recall last year, a thousand years ago, that Anthony, you had included a list of project closeouts. I, I'm either, I thought I remembered it being in the CIP book last year. So that's where I looked for it this year and I didn't see it. So caveat, I didn't look in the big book for it. Um, do we have a list of that? Did we do that this year? We did that as a special request by council and we forwarded it to you separately from the budget documents. It's actually not a bad idea to include that in the budget documents, uh, but we can certainly prepare that information for you again. You'll recall that we, we did a special list of closed out projects as we were trying to identify funds to be transferred for the transit and um, um, fire um, maintenance facility. Uh, and so those project closeouts were transferred to that project but we certainly have an ongoing list of projects that have been closed out that may or may not have been finally accepted by the council and returned to fund balance. And so, yes, we can certainly prepare that for you. Whether we put it in the budget document at your direction, we can do it either way. We could just do it as a memo sort of information to you um, or include in the budget document. I mean, I'd sure like to see it and I'll just kind of leave the breadcrumb out there since, you know, this is the last time we'll be speaking in this capacity, uh, but I'll leave it for everyone else that I think that is a good idea to add moving forward. It might kind of become somewhat obsolete once we have an internal auditor. I'm not so sure, but at least in the meantime, that might not be a bad thing to add to ongo the ongoing processes. Um, so I appreciate that, but I would at least like to see a list, especially since we're looking at red numbers, which I don't like to see. So. Um, which and I will say we don't need an internal auditor for that. That's okay. that's, Jacob, that's Jacob's job. And he, he keeps a pretty good running list of, of those projects that have been, are you really complete? And he's, he's um, kind of bird dogging the project managers. Uh, what do you really have left to do? That sort of thing. So. Well, Jacob sure looks audacious. I'm sure he's just as audacious in person. Um, so I certainly wouldn't want to step on his toes or take anything away from him. But I do think that that would be a good thing to add to the budget book going forward if council agrees. Um, so I appreciate that. My next question is, I was kind of trying to refresh my memory from last year and I came on to one of the slides from last year that showed only a projected deficit for fiscal year 22 of 235,880. We're looking at a much bigger number than that. Is there a concise reason why? I will, I will defer to the project managers if I'm mis, misstating anything here, but I would say that it's just related to the cost inflation of various projects and the um, particularly the capital sales tax revenue has not come in at as fast a rate as it was budgeted for in the past year. So the combination of those two things has, has exacerbated that already existing problem that you pointed out. Okay, I was wondering, I was wondering 
also if we are starting to experience or should be expecting to experience any impact from the incredibly significant increase in cost of construction materials right now. It's not going to be a long-term problem as I understand it, but it's going to be and already is an exceedingly costly short-term project so or problem. So have there been any discussions with our projects that are anticipated starting in the next 30, 60, 90, 120 days about the cost benefit of delaying a little bit in order to not pay three to five times the amount for copper wire or lumber. Yeah, and again, I will defer to the project managers if I'm misstating anything, but our strategy has been kind of the opposite of that. We Everything that we hear is that it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. So we're trying to get our projects underway and bid with those guaranteed maximum prices from our construction managers at risk. We're trying to get that locked in as quick as we can so that it doesn't get way out of hand. And, and that's kind of our strategy right now. And um, so and, or anybody may, may correct me if I'm wrong. Well, it, it, in a couple of conversations we've had with a couple of the architectural firms working on our big projects, um, they've got teams of people looking at lead times on every one of the construction components. And what we're seeing them do is shift between, you know, the original concept may have had wooden floor joists or roof joists and the lead time on those may be 18 months but we can get them in steel in 12 weeks so all of a sudden they're shifting the materials around they're still conscious of what our budgets are uh, but they are working mightily to make sure one uh, whatever we wind up with in terms of construction materials they're available uh, and uh, you know and, and two that we don't blow the budget we heard uh, along that conversation uh, as an example, that uh, Amazon went out and placed an order for one third of all of the production for wooden ro uh, roof joist material, so that regardless of uh, any you know material slowdown, they can still go forward full speed with every distribution center they have on the books, and they've got enough yeah. buying power to control the market. So they are causing us to to. Uh, really double check where all of the sources for these materials are. And if there are alternatives, uh, they are being pursued mightily. I appreciate that. And I hope that you'll just be really cautious with those price guarantees. Cause from what I understand the it's no longer 30 days, it might be seven days. So, <laughs> you know, might be, might be, sorry, <laughs> it might've been good this morning, but it's not good now. So, you know, I just really want us to be cognizant of the pricing and, you know, I know, I know it's painful, but I certainly don't want to have to explain to the public why we just paid three to five times more than we should have because we didn't want to wait. I understand not wanting to wait, but you know, we are working with taxpayer dollars and the prices I'm seeing are making me nauseous. And I can imagine Sean is the same way. <laughs> Okay, uh, two questions, well, two last questions. One is that I seem to see this recurring language every year, Anthony, and so this is not a trick question. I just wanna know if this is kind of like an annual financial disclaimer or if this is something that we have a plan to address. Bond reserves are unbalanced. <laughs> I feel like I've seen this every year for the last couple of years. Is this something that through a variety of factors is just difficult to get a handle on or is this, Again, just kind of like that disclaimer of no, that's you know, almost going to happen. That's almost entirely related to the 2012 general obligation bond program, particularly related to um, th the cost overrun for the Lindsay project that kind of threw everything else out of kilter. Um, and because the 36th Avenue project is kind of the last one um, to be funded, that's where that out of balance situation has fallen. But you saw that number, and and because of that imbalance, for lack of a better term, um, that's where that has to be made up. Whether it's through um, getting the additional federal funds that we hope to get, or continuing to delay the project or whatever, yes, that is an ongoing problem that we're pointing out to you each each meeting and each uh, year, uh, but that it continues. Okay, I appreciate knowing that. Um, and then my last kind of question slash comment is that 
I already had someone reach out to me about this uh, on page 124, the Vineyard Flooding Improvement Project. I feel like we talked about this last year. It was on all the slides for last year. We nixed it last year when our capital improvement budget wasn't even, outlook wasn't even as bad as it is this year. And the person who flagged it for me happens to be someone who had a problem and did not get the city, to, was not able to get the city to pay for it. And the question being, why this project and not ours over here or not my friends over on the other side of town. Um, and so I'm very concerned with the precedent that it sets to pay for this project. We had a pretty extensive conversation about it last year. Um, you know, I know that there are a few new faces, but I mean, when we're looking at a deficit, even this year of what we're looking at, that is not going to be resolved within the next budget year. I just don't know that I personally feel comfortable or would feel comfortable voting on this. Of course, I'm not voting on it, but um, so I just wanted to put that out there. I know the reasons why it's in there and I do sympathize and empathize very much. Um, but that's one that gives me some heartburn. So I appreciate everyone. And uh, I'll be handing my book full of notes over to Brandy before next week. Thank you all. If I may, Mayor and Council, uh, Councilmember Bearman, that the Vineyard Project is not proposed to be funded this year with city funds. We are pursuing a federal grant program through FEMA and staff, uh, Dr. Evenson and her staff are working hard to pursue that, um, but uh, we, it, it'll be months before we hear whether that grant is eligible or not. So that, I'm not sure what you're seeing there, but that project is not funded in the, in the FY22 program. Okay, I'm very sorry. I saw it on page 124 and it we'll looks like it has an FYE expenditure. So it looked to me, I saw that it was, you know, the FEMA mitigation. So my assumption was that it required a local share of some percentage. And that's what I assumed it was in. So if someone could follow up with me about that, it's on page 124 of the small book. We'll do Thank that. You. We'll, that could be a misprint, but we'll make sure that's right. But you know, we are not intending to fund that project. And uh, it, it appears yeah, if, if I may, the no match program. Councilmember yeah. Beerman, where you look on page 124, you'll see that the majority of funds for that project, even though it's in the capital budget, um, fund 22 is the grant fund. So that's where we're just accounting for the grant project that, that Sean is talking about, but it is a capital project, so it shows up here. It's just that the source of revenue is a grant. Okay, so when it, it I mean, I see in here it says 25% local match. So I assume that was the cash and that it was an expenditure. Is that is that the engineering services and other things that we have provided in the past to get us to this point? That's correct. Uh, we're getting okay. what we think. Uh, again, the, the grant has yet to be administered or awarded. We feel pretty good about it, but um, but we will be using some of our uh, already dedicated dollars for design that the council did previously approve for that. And then there may be another match required that, that, that will depend on the, the granting process. And at that point, council would be asked whether to match the grant or not. Um, but that will be a future decision to be made. And of course, I assume at that time, you'll list everything that has been paid up until that point. You so I appreciate it. Thanks. Councilmember Member Pika. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I just had a quick question. Um, I didn't see it on this year's CIP budget, but could somebody talk to the status of the Gray Street two-way conversion real quick? You bet. Uh Councilmember, uh, that is shown on one of the slides in the 2019 transportation bond program. It is currently uh, targeted or was originally targeted in the in that program in 2022. So we are on track for that. Our design team is working well uh, right now. Uh, there'll be a lot more public engagement, I think, this next year, actually the next 12 months, certainly, as we refine the design of the project. Uh, and then Later this year, we will be coming back to council with the same discussion we had last year about uh, sort of rejuggling those uh, 2019 transportation bond projects uh, in the in the 
case that we might be able to to acquire federal funds for a project that was previously planned to be fully funded with the bond program. We did that this year with the Porter Street Streetscape project, and we were able to generate another three or four million dollars for that project. And when we did that, those original dollars then go to other projects in the program that might not have been funded. So we'll, we'll be having that discussion with you. It does appear that the Gray Street project and the uh, James Garner phase three might be good candidates for federal funding. Uh, if council gives us the green light to do that, we would submit those applications in September of this year and the awards would be granted in December. Uh, if that were the case, that project might slip a year in time. So it might move from 2022 to 2023. That'll also be a decision that council will, will want to make in addition to the funding um, uh, formula. I appreciate that. That's uh, really good information to hear. So thank you. Council Foreman. So Daryl, I don't know if you um, could be the one to answer this. Um, one of the slides talks about our fleet and it's a pretty significant um, cost for fleet. And this is obviously something near and dear to my heart that I do for the state. Um, when do we retire our vehicles? What, cause that's a lot of vehicles that we're kind of cycling through, like how many miles, like how do we determine that we need to update our fleet? Um, we do have a fleet management system and uh, we start off with an assumption based on the vehicle and the nature of its uh, utilization. Some of the assumptions have changed over time. Take home vehicle programs and the public safety fleet, et cetera, have extended the useful life. Um, those vehicles do seem to get more care when we know that you're the only one driving that vehicle. Uh, they don't get swapped out you know, to uh, three different shifts over the course of a day. Um, our fleet uh, superintendent, uh, one of the things they do is they look at, you know, the next round of acquisitions. Uh, as an example, we bought several Ford Explorers uh, for that public safety fleet, and they are evaluated over that lifespan of that first round of acquisitions of Explorers. And they figure out where the maintenance issues are, uh, what wears out faster, what is the resale value when we're at the end of that useful life. So let's say it has 140,000 miles on it. What's it worth then? What kind of gas mileage does it get? So what is the total life cost of each one of those vehicles? And, and, the, and the shop tracks it. If we find that we've got a particular make and model of a vehicle that doesn't seem to hold up as well, uh, we'll probably be recommending we, we buy different uh, makes and models to meet that same uh, fleet mandate. Um, Mr. O'Leary's team uh, operates our fleet. Sean, any additional details about how the decisions are made as to when we retire uh, those fleet vehicles out? Thank you, Daryl. We just mentioned, Councilor Foreman, first of all, we have over 950 pieces of you know, vehicles or equipment items. And uh, as our fleet superintendent reminds me frequently, if they make one, we own it. So we have a, a wide variety, everything from police cars to pickup trucks to semi trucks to backhoes to uh, buses and so on. So each one of those has a, a life cycle that we try to, to hit. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Um, we don't hit them very often. In fact, we run the wheels right off of most of our vehicles before we're able to get the money to replace them. So a trash truck today, we have about 60 of those. Uh, we'll, we'll get about eight years of life on a good, on a good truck. Uh, a pickup truck, we're going to keep in the system for 14 or 15 years. A typical police patrol vehicle is, is about an eight year life. And so that's just an example. We can, we, I can sure print out those for you on our, our projected design life and our actual design life. But the reality is that we are well beyond the design life for most of our fleet because we just can't get the, the funding to replace them on the cycle that we want to. Uh, this year, uh, Anthony mentioned we're replacing 33 items, 33 units. Uh, we requested 150 replacements to put that into context. So we're 120 away from meeting our targets for replacement. And it's a, it's a problem that we're going to have to address here. We haven't found the magic uh, formula yet to do that. There just is not enough dollars to go around. So instead of replacing them, we're just repairing them and keeping them running as long as we can. Is there um, any council member, uh, just 
because we all lived through the hailstorm. Uh, <laughs> and just to give you some insight as to what our conversations were in, in addressing the damage, uh, most of our fleet lives outside uncovered. Uh, we had 28 patrol vehicles with broken windows and lots of little dents. Uh, several pickup trucks. Some of the heavier equipment is a little sturdier built and probably less noticeable on a garbage truck than it is on one of our regular fleet vehicles. Uh, our initial conversations were, let's go ahead and replace the glass as quickly as we can. Um, it's really not, you're not supposed to be driving them down the street with broken windshields, but we know some windshields are back ordered through August of, uh, of this year before they'll be available. Uh, and then our, our desire to hold off on a lot of the body work <clears throat> until the general public has had the chance to get in all the body shops, we've got enough dinged up vehicles. We could flood every paint and body shop in, you know, the Metro along with, uh, you know, other uh, larger fleets that were damaged. I'm told uh, the school district sustained substantial damage in some of their buses, not a lot of broken glass, but every one of them's got dents in it. Um, so we wanted to hold off, let the public get caught up on their insurance claims and their vehicle repairs then we'll start addressing uh, some of the dents and dings uh, in our vehicles uh, as, as shop uh, availability brings itself back. Is there a cost benefit to buying instead of leasing the vehicles? Uh, we are in conversations with Enterprise Fleet. Um, they are starting to reemerge post pandemic uh, and make appointments again and come back out to the sites. Uh, and our goal is to get them out here this summer. We think as uh, our governor has just ended his emergency declaration, our uh, mask mandate on the books through uh, the 1st of June. And our goal is to get them out here uh, this summer and let them evaluate our fleet and make a proposal that we can uh, bring back to council um, to see if there is a, a better way, a more cost-effective way to drive a newer, safer, healthier fleet. Because I know that we drive them to like 100,000 miles and everything falls off in between then. So if we could probably it, swap them out at about 30,000, which is when their resale value reaches its peak. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they just spread that cost out a, a little more evenly. They are masters of that fleet administration, especially the resale side of the equation. All right. Thank you. Councilor Ever Holman. Thank you. I would just, uh, request that uh, if possible we keep the crown victorias going as long as possible in the pd fleet uh, they seem to be not, bulletproof those things last forever <laughs> well i don't like the new new ones at all and i've i have heard from more than a few police officers over the years that don't like the new ones either and one of my good friends uh still drives the crown victoria and he washes it every day and it looks great because he's doesn't want to, he, he is dreading having to transfer over to the new ones at some point. So um, keep those going. Thanks. Um, yeah. yeah, so, um, and this might not be the appropriate time to bring this up, but the, uh, how are we on track with the with our strategic water supply plan because I'm not seeing a whole lot um, regarding our progress towards Lake Thunderbird augmentation or uh, I guess in 2025, we should be approaching the final phase of our transmission network expansion and storage take rehab for uh, non-potable reuse. Um, I'm not seeing any... Uh, I'll let, I'll let Mr. Mattingly address that, but we will be concentrating on the enterprise funds like the water enterprise at the May the 18th study session. Okay. That's it. I'm ready to talk about it, but it'll be May 18th. <laughs> All right. I guess I'm just a little too eager. Uh, I look forward to it. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from council regarding this item? Seeing none, I will now entertain a motion to enter into executive session. Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. Or do we want to call? Okay. All right. So moved. Okay. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to end this meeting and I'm going to send you another Zoom link um, to your email and uh, we'll jump on a separate meeting. So 
Okay. <laughs> I know that's really kind of scrambled that up, but basically go ahead and jump off and look for an uh, Aniva.